Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the third and last session for today on global observ observing of ocean acidification and ecological response. Uh, my name is Arthur Chen from Taiwan, and there are five short presentations to start with Jerry Blackford. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to give a perspective from the regional modeler's point of view, so I will try and do that. Uh, just to explain to you who I am, um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I, I lead the regional modeling uh, part of the UK OA program, and within that we are looking at both Northwest European shelf and Arctic seas, and in fact at PML we're looking at the shelf my colleagues at Liverpool and Southampton are looking at the Arctic. I'm just going to use examples from our shelf modelling um, because I have them more to hand, but it's not to exclude the Arctic. I particularly want to thank Yuri Artioli, who's probably at the back there, who's, who's done most of the simulations that I'm going to show. So I want to set myself up as being uh, kind of the opposite end of the, the spectrum from the big sort of Earth system global modelling. And whilst I don't disagree with this at all, I think it can paint quite a, a sort of a, a nice, simple picture of what things are like. Um, and I just pick on that particular paper because it, it landed in my inbox a couple of weeks ago. But I think you've got to be really sure to, to bear in mind that that only works at large temporal and spatial integrations. And what biology sees and experiences, the carbonic chemistry it experiences, is driven by all sorts of things, biology, by physics, that happens at very local scales. And as a shameless plug for a paper by Kevin Flynn et al. last year, these local scales can be sub-millimeter. It really can be that, that, uh, that small. And the other thing I'd like to emphasize is there's a lot of emphasis on the sea surface. But I think we need, must also really remember the seafloor systems, which have at least semi-distinct carbonate chemistry, um, often very distinct carbonate chemistry. And why is that important? Well, if we look on the European shelf, at least one order of magnitude and probably two orders of magnitude more calcification happens on the seafloor compared to the pelagic. So if we are worried about calcification, we should be quite worried about the seafloor and for, for more reasons which I'll come to later on. So I'm, I'm going to kind of argue um, that this regional perspective requires, or I think a long-term perspective is obvious and goes without saying, but we need to have a decent temporal resolution. Um, we need to have a decent spatial resolution we need a fuller discrimination of the carbonate chemistry than just two from four. Um, that we also need to discriminate the other drivers, not just the other drivers of carbonate chemistry, the biology, the physics, etc., but the other drivers of the ecosystem that are happening and changing at the same time. So that's temperature, but it's also changes to river and nutrient inputs, etc., etc. And then if we want to move towards an assessment of impacts, what do we actually choose to do that? So I put the BATS uh, data set up there as a nice example of something that gives you a great temporal resolution. And I, I have to admit that if you ask a modeler what you want, we always ask for the world. And I kind of apologize, but then I don't apologize for that because, because I'm just being honest about what we need. Um, so these are animations from our model um, that are just there to give you an indication of how spatial and temporally variable we think that pH really is. Um, we've evaluated this against data and it does a reasonable job and seeing a lot of data this morning I was quite encouraged as well. So you've got uh, surface on the top, seafloor on the bottom, present day, future. But the real message is, is this spatial variability that's, that's really quite extreme. So if you're going to be measuring it, you've got to really pick and choose your, your places or your transects quite carefully. Um, this is um, the same information, really, um, but it's on a transit that's uh, south to north up the North Sea, present day and future pH. And you can see how the pH is associated with where the biological production is. It's affected by mixing, which happens at different places and different times. And perhaps this can give an indication of the interesting places to start doing some measurements. Um, 
in the future. So these are going through annual cycles uh, towards the end of, uh, well, towards the end of last century and the end of this century. So we can begin to see, you know, where the biology is is really driving uh, low pH, and as well as the physics is trapping this this kind of high DIC water here um, through the through the system. So. I thought I ought to put a slide in to sort of uh, just emphasize it's not just kind of model fantasy that I'm trying to inflict upon you. There have been lots of observations of, of coastal anomalies. Uh, the Tim Witness paper on Tatoosh Island has shown a very, very sort of swift decrease in pH over recent years. There's a really nice data set um, that's uh, off the Dutch coast that was written up by Provost et al couple of year, few years ago, and this shows, again, some very, very sort of interesting and extreme trends in pH. And then there's a paper by Guy Pence et al, which shows how all this is really strongly influenced by rivers. And it's not really surprising that all this kind of thing is going on, because you, you, we're dealing with places where you've got land, atmosphere, rivers, sediments, sea, and people coming together. So the first plea that I would make is we really do need intensive boundary data to be able to constrain our systems. And I picked out a quote from Tim's paper, because uh, I thought it summed it up better than I can. Our results provide clear links between pH and biological activity, which may be essential to incorporate when developing quantitative predictions of ocean pH in response to anthropogenic change. Couldn't agree more. Um, this issue about measuring carbonate chemistry. I think any two from four works, works well enough out in the oceans, but it's not necessarily great in coastal waters completely falls down when you get anywhere near the sediments. Um, and I think during the first part of this week, we, we've seen some interesting evidence and, and also some analysis that, that refines that. Um, we need to point out that modelers usually need uh, DIC and TA to drive our models. Um, TA is a difficult one um, because we know that different river systems are, are can contribute var hugely variable and changing amounts of alkalinity. We've been alerted to the fact that dissolved organic matter production can uh, generate alkalinity in this paper, and that there's anaerobic alkalinity generation in sediments as well. And of course, if you're working in shelf seas, which where the, the sediments and the surface waters are very tightly coupled, very important to get a handle on that. Um, and we can show through our model work, and, and there's, there was a great uh, poster up here earlier this week that, uh, you know, you, you, there are significant errors between derived and measured PCO2 and pH if you're looking uh, using DIC and TA as your master variables and various other combinations. So my plea would be for some really good spatial and temporal coverage of, well, from, from my point of view, DIC and TA, but also some information on PCO2 or pH as well to help us along. So moving on to impacts. So this is showing... Um, it's the same transect as before, and that's a plot of the, uh, of the sea floor on the shelf, showing aragonite saturation towards the end of the century. There's slightly different simulations, actually. This is showing daily seasonal variability in the daily scale for a few years, and this is monthly uh, means. But if we're worried about undersaturation affecting calcification, our model is suggesting that it's really a feature that is spatially and temporally restricted at the end of the century under this scenario, uh, given it's a model, to an area here where you get the trapping of high respiration um, sort of below the thermocline and you get less mixing than you do here and this part of the system's completely mixed. So I think this indicates that when we talk about saturation state in places like the shelf, you can't really talk about a mean at all. It doesn't make sense and you've got to tie that up to life cycles of creatures that may be calcifying. Is the undersaturation happening at a critical phase of their life cycle or not? I just, it, it's another challenge for us. So how on earth do we start to work out what the impacts are? Um, I've picked out three things here um, which I think are important to try and understand what the ecosystem level impacts are. And there's, there are others as well, of course, but these three are just here for an example. We've been looking at processes, a lot individual processes, and they can't often tell you too much about how the whole system will behave in the future. But I would argue that it's very important to get a handle on primary production. 
And these maps are essentially difference plots for between current situation and the end of the century under different scenarios with different OA feedbacks or without feedbacks, all of which could change as our knowledge increases. But it again shows that changes are going to be spatially um, different depending on where you are and depending on the strength of your feedbacks as well. And it's not just the space, it's the time, because the model's suggesting that the phenology of it all is changing quite significantly. So we have to resolve this, 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 both this spatial and this temporal signal if we are to really understand if there are going to be significant changes to ecosystems. So the other one, um, the, one of the, the second one I've brought out is the food, to, food supply, organic matter supply to the benthic system. And how does this change? So this is our present day estimation. This is a future scenario um, without any OA feedbacks, and this is a future scenario with some OA impacts, but obviously not all of the ones that could happen. And again, it shows that you've got a spatially distinct set of uh, occurrences that you probably need to put some, make sure you're getting information from the Irish Sea, as well as the Southern North Sea or the Channel, as well as the Northern North Sea, to really constrain or understand what's going on. And the final one I put up, and I think it, it pretty much says the same thing, is the, is the nutrient flux back out of the benthic system, which is very important in shelf seas. And again, you see similar sorts of, of complex spatial patterns as well. So why, you know, in some cases, the mean might ch not change too much. Where it's happening can change, may change quite considerably, if you leave the models. So I think the final couple of slides I have are on um, what kind of observational strategies fit in well for us. I think as modelers, we, regional models, we tend to find that information from fixed stations, which has very high temporal variability um, and the potential for a wide range of measurements, the biology, the physics, the carbon chemistry, et cetera, et cetera, are the most useful because then we can analyze all the drivers or try to. So we have an observatory down in Plymouth called the Western Channel Observatory, which has got fantastic biology for 100 years, and we're just trying to get the carbonate chemistry up to speed. Um, the BAT site is another example, and you know, you, you know as an audience many more of them than I do, I'm sure. I also think that fixed transits can be very useful, and that shows that the transits that are taken under the Dutch um, system, uh, which is you can find on, on the... In a, on the, on the web under this water base uh, sort of database. And this gives you a, a fairly decent temporal um, resolution, decent spatial discrimination. It gives quite a lot of chemistry, not a great deal of biology, but some. And again, if that kind of information is fantastically useful, but of course I recognize is, is quite an undertaking. Cruise programs, as a modeler, I think we find the least useful because Yes, you get good spatial coverage, but the temporal scale is suboptimal. And if our models only have skill when you integrate them at, say, over weeks or months, a one-off cruise track going through a point is very difficult to, uh, to use to evaluate your model. And, of course, the model evaluation is absolutely essential if you want to believe any, any of the pictures that we throw up. So I think finally then, really, what observations would I start to recommend? Um, and I think this is just the start of the list, but these are the ones I would kind of like to emphasize. Uh, better discrimination of the carbonate system, um, seafloor and sediments, uh, some discrimination of the biology, production minus respiration, uh, community structure, the phenology, the organic matter transfer down to the benthos and up through the trophic system. But also its stoichiometry and its and its stability. How how useful is it, and how easy is it to to to, de to degrade by the rest of the biology? We need to know much more about carbonate content, dissolution, calcification rates, and our other diagenesis to get a handle on um, this alkalinity problem in shelf seas. I think, and things that we think are sensitive, like bioturbation rates and the nutrient exchange, are are rather rather important. So I think that's all I've got to say, except for a last slide that sort of sums up the thinkings, which are try and think vertical surface seafloor sediments. We need to constrain this natural, spatial, and temporal var variability, and we need to record co-drivers of carbonate chemistry and impacts 
And finally, there are some appropriate big picture biological metrics that will be very useful for us in assessing impact. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Uh, we may have time for one short question or comment. Thank you, Mark Oman, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. You make a compelling case for the importance of spatial variability, and I wonder, have you considered the use of autonomous gliders? Because um, yeah, although you do have to use the two-for-four four approach, I'm not aware of sufficient sensors that, that would uh, measure exactly what you want. Uh, they do have the, a, the capability for um, broad spatial coverage and repeated sampling in defined localities, uh, as you may need. I, no, I think that's exactly right, and, and I, I left that out just really because of the constraints of time. But, and, and I, but I think they can definitely contribute a lot. I think the key is to try and join up all these different data sets which has already been stated, to make sure those, those autonomous vehicle measurements can maybe figure in with, with the fixed time stations as well, so we can join them up in a sensible way. Okay, thank you, Jerry. The next speaker will be Dick Feedy. is OA processes and impacts in U.S. coastal waters. Well, thank you. I want to thank the conveners for inviting me to talk about uh, the U.S. program. And I'm very excited to be here. What I wanted to talk about are what are the components of the observing system in our coastal regions uh, along U.S. East Coast and West Coast. What are the present conditions? So I'll talk about what conditions we have seen and why they occur, and particularly I want to talk about some of the processes, because in our coastal regions we have combined process of anthropogenic ocean acidification and natural acidification, and, and it's really important to understand and be able to delineate the different processes and why they're occurring. The U.S. The uh, program is uh, sponsored by eight federal agencies working together to monitor and observe to develop ecosystem impacts, model changes, and develop adaptation strategies, education and outreach. We work this through the interagency working group uh, and, and have a very nice strategic plan to carry that out. This is our observing system that we have. The red dots are what Kathy explained were the uh, mooring systems and the blue ones are the coastal cruises and the green ones are the offshore cruises. We have a combination of hydrographic cruises, volunteering observing ships, which we do underway measurements in surface waters, buoys, um, mostly moorings right now, but floats and gliders are in the future. And we are under development a number of di different types of floats and gliders. Uh, that I think can do a lot for getting high resolution data in space and time. A very important consideration is we have anthropogenic CO2 exchanging across the air sea interface and, and, and causing the acidification that we know about. And we also have upwelling and invection of water onto the continental shelf. This is usually CO2 rich water because it has the respiration products from, from respiration. And we have to look at the changes that are occurring because these are different effects. In addition to that, we have organic matter being produced, phytoplankton being produced in the surface waters, which sink to the seafloor and remineralize in a local condition. So not only do you have an upwelling signal, which is CO2 enriched, but you have a localized event. And if that respiration is large enough, it can cause hypoxia. And in many areas along our coast, we see that hypoxia. So we have to think about how these local hypoxic events may add to the acidification in our regions. And this is particularly important in the U.S. West Coast. Here's an example of the various kinds of impacts that are, are enhancing the acidification. The Gulf of Mexico, we have hypoxia in, uh, off the coast of Mississippi River here in the Louisiana, Texas border. This ha happens seasonally. Uh, primarily in the, in the summertime months. In the uh, U.S. West Coast, we have uh, upwelling along the entire coast, and in the summertime, again, hypoxia takes over and, and draws down that, that uh, pH even lower. And we often see hypoxic conditions occurring uh, 
in some of our uh, estuaries as well. So we have to think about all these processes together and how they'll affect the local acidification and what the organisms will they'll be looking at over the course of time. Now, another issue that's really important, this is a geochemical issue, and this was brought up by Wei Jun Kai, is the concept that if you have respiration occurring in the subsurface waters, that's going to change the Revell factor or the buffer factor of seawater so that when you have higher CO2 water from respiration process, you're going to actually increase the impact of that on the decrease in pH in seawater. And this is illustrated here where under normal conditions we might have a, a pH change on the order of about uh, 0.027 under normal uh, atmospheric conditions. When we get into the very high CO2 waters in, 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 in our coastal regions where there is enhanced respiration taking place, that same amount of DIC change could cause a pH change as much as 0.4 or, or more. So this enhanced acidification uh, effect because of the Revell factor is very, very important. This is the so what factor that Jane was talking about in her presentation. As we increase the level of CO2 in the atmosphere and we increase the DIC concentration in the oceans, we're going to enhance the ocean acidification impact, meaning there's a real significant impact if we wait on mitigation in, in terms of how it will affect the acidification of our future oceans. So this is a very important chemical effect that we don't need to consider in studying what will happen in the future. In addition to that, our local river systems have a very different alkalinity. Some tropical uh, and, uh, river systems have very low alkalinity, and so they will bring in water of low alkalinity, and therefore low saturation state. Mississippi River, on the other hand, is a region of very high alkalinity, so it brings on water of very high saturation state. So we need to know with each of our estuarine systems, what's the natural conditions of, of the local chemistry and how that affect the, not only the acidification in those river systems, but in the abatements around those river systems as shown here with, with very uh, uh, significant impact in the region around the, the estuaries of, the, uh, of undersaturated waters. We've seen that Joe Salisbury has shown us very clearly in Maine, for example, where the low saturation state waters penetrate out into the local embayment and can actually affect those ecosystems, those clams and oysters and scallops in that region. This is our East Coast and Gulf Coast observing system as we have laid it out here. These are the uh, lines of stations that we normally occupy and, and the mooring systems. And on the basis of our GOMAC cruises led by uh, uh, Rick Weinikoff and colleagues, we can see that there's a very strong gradient in the saturation state coming from the very high saturation states in our tropical regions to lower saturation states as we proceed north. And this is primarily controlled by the natural D, uh, alkalinity, the DIC change, in which the, the, the decrease in alkalinity at the higher latitudes due to the input of fresh water from higher latitudes causes a very succinct gradient in the saturation state. So the areas of vulnerability be different along these regimes. You can see this true in the surface waters, very clearly in the subsurface waters as we go along. So that freshwater input provides a very significant impact on the, on the uh, saturation state and the vulnerability. And what Joe Salisbury has done is done a very nice job of looking at the observational data and seeing what the temporal changes, this is the temporal changes of the uh, daily changes in the uh, delta uh, PCO2 through the course of a spring and summer season and taking those observations and then with one dimensional models, breaking it out into the changes that take place. So here's the observations that we see. Here's the impact due to air-sea exchange. Here's the impact due to uh, uh, vective processes, vertical mixing from below and net community production. By looking at these various different components of the carbonate system, understanding the, those physical and chemical controls, we can then de de develop a good understanding of the uh, attribution of these processes in our coastal ecosystem and be able to predict what they will look like in the future. 
On our west coast, we have been doing much the same kind of work. Here we're dominated by a wind-controlled upwelling system in the spring and summertime when the winds shift to coming from the northwest. They draw bottom waters onto our continental shelf along the bottom, which go all the way to the, the, to the coast and then project out. And so what we see on our west coast is here, for example, the impact of our largest river, the Columbia River. We see a very strong uh, undersaturated water in the surface waters due to the Columbia River, which can project all the way into Puget Sound and all the way south of London, of course. We see very strong upwelling signals off of Newport, Oregon, and off of California, and off of uh, San Francisco Bay. And we can also see the, the same impacts in pH. Generally speaking, the upwelling signal is our dominant signal, but you can see areas, particularly in our coastal embayments, that are dominated by the river systems. And this is shown pretty nicely here. So this is a section off the Columbia River, and we can distinguish then the chemistry of the surface waters in the very surface Columbia River waters, which are very high in oxygen, high in PCO2, low in saturation state. And that's quite a bit different from the upwelled water, which you can see here, which projects up to about 20 meters, which is very low in oxygen and high in CO2. So you can actually fingerprint these different water masses. And you can say which water masses are getting into our abatements, which are impacting our shellfish industry. And therefore, by the chemistry itself, we can say what the local sources are and how they're affecting that chemistry. This is a very nice work by Catherine Harris uh, and uh, colleagues about a time series of stations right off of Newport, Oregon. This is from 2007 to 2011. This is the uh, mooring site in the surface waters at the shelf break, and then this, the same mooring site in the bottom waters. And what you can see is during the upwelling season, which you can denote here from the shift in the wind patterns from about May to September, you can see a very striking variability uh, due to that upwelling. But you can see we do in surface waters do indeed get into corrosive conditions in May, June, and July. And they can extend for long periods of time during some years. It varies from one year to the next. And, and what you can see then is you can use these kind of data sets to see what the changes have taken place since the pre-industrial. And the saturation state then has been about 0.52 lower from the pre-industrial and that the undersaturated waters are, are now enriched by about 30% from what they were in the pre-industrial. And our modeling efforts that we have going along with it, which Claudine Hari and, and, uh, and Nikki Gruber have done for the, our coastal system has shown that by as early as 2050, we will see corrosive waters in this region at least 50% of the time. And, and so we now have to, to be able to adapt to the kinds of changes that we're seeing right now to what they will be just uh, another 30 or 40 years from now and change our adaptation strategy as we move forward. We have been able to use that kind of chemical information then to, 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 to be able to delineate the, the acidification that's due to the upwelling process the acidification that's due to the deep composition of organic matter in locally uh, due to normal respiration process and acidification that's actually due to the CO2 emissions themselves. And you can see from this that there are striking differences between Washington, Oregon, Northern, Central, and Southern California. And this is due to the local biogeochemical process that are taking place. The amount of anthropogenic CO2 in most of these regions are about the same. So we're seeing the dramatic, dramatic differences between the local respiration processes from, from south to north. And so the, from that, then we can be able to discern how these processes affect the local ecosystems. And what we do within our program is all the data sets that we gather through the national program are then distributed to the community through, through IUS. And we provide this data in real time with the IUS observing system, providing real time data sets here. For example, this is the surface ocean PCO2 at this mooring site here, the Cheva mooring site. And we distribute that nationally so that we can provide information to our stakeholders 
in real time. So they go and come up here, look at what happened yesterday, determine what the pH changes are in their region and make a decision in real time. And we're working to develop that capability in the future. We also allow our stakeholders to provide their data sets into this system. So they are contributors as well as users. And that really brings up a very strong motivation for them to contribute to this process. And it's really worked quite well. Um, many of our stakeholders are very highly involved in what uh, impacts ocean acidifications are into their particular uh, 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 effort in, from, a, from, a, from um, the hatchery perspective. And this actually occurred because in 2006, the hatcheries found that the pH changes that were occurring in their, their vats, in their vats were actually having a significant impact on the oyster industry itself. Within about two years, their, their production of the oyster seed dropped about 80% uh, over two years period. And they reached out to the scientists, Burke Hales uh, led this effort, to actually develop systems right in the hatchery to see the conditions using the same instrumentation we have out in the field. And what we found is that was their direct correlation between the chemistry in the hatcheries and the production of the oyster larvae. So this was, for example, an experiment that was done by hatchery scientists in collaboration with Burke Hales and colleagues, showing the relative production rate as a function of saturation state. And as we see here, production rates fell to zero at a saturation state of all, about 1.6. This is the first clear example of a tipping point for ocean acidification for oyster larvae. And what we found occurring with the oyster larvae in the hatchery was occurring also in our shellfish beds. The reason for this was that in the first couple of year, days of life of the oyster larvae, they have to build their shells so they can settle out. And they use the energy from their egg sats to produce that shell. And if the pH conditions are low enough, there's not a, enough energy in their egg sats to produce their shell, and they simply die off. So this is a very clear impact of ocean acidification. And it was during our upwelling conditions when the, the uh, oyster larvae were dying off. So we developed some adaptation strategies to allow them to avoid this process. And now what they do is they alter the water that's coming in to raise the pH, and actually production levels have gone up. So we need to begin to think in terms, as scientists, in terms of developing the adaptation strategies as well as developing observing systems to allow them to know when this is occurring. This slide shows the impact on the oyster shell itself of these high CO2 levels. There was evidence of dissolution occurring. They were malformed and indeed they were dying. In the future, we have a number of new approaches that we want to add to our observing system that we're developing, again, with our colleagues uh, in the academic institutions. For example, Slocum gliders here, which can profile through the water column, make measurements of pH and, and uh, temperature and salinity and oxygen, and therefore get the high resolution data sets that we want to look like, looking at them spatially. We also are developing wave gliders that move along the surface, essentially replacing ships, get very highly resolved maps. You can put these out for several months and run, run a mapping system that can continue through uh, several months. And we're also developing what we call a carbon uh, prowler, which goes up and down a mooring line and gets uh, temperature, salinity, oxygen, and pH data. So all these new developments we'll be bringing into line in our observing system to allow us to be able to get the high resolution data we're all looking for. So in conclusion then, our continent shelf under saturated zone, uh, pHs are less than 7.7 or so. We often see this in the near bottom waters in, in the uh, late summer months. The largest respiration signals are found in the coastal hypoxic regions due to the respiration process. This can be as much as 10 to 4 percent of the total acidification <coughs> signal. So really quite important. It really raises the CO2 levels to as high as about 1,200 parts per million. <laughs> 
And in addition to the, the anthropogenic CO2 uh, uptake, upwelling respiration processes must be considered when you're considering how to design an experiment of acidification with marine organisms, because these are the, the concentrations they're seeing every single day. And some river plumes significantly add to the acidification in our coastal embayments, and so we have to consider how they will affect our ecosystems in our, in our coastal waters. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dick. Are there pressing questions or comments? Yes. Thank you for the talk. This is very interesting. Uh, one question. Do you have the evolution of the upwelling uh, in the coast that you show? If they are decreasing or, or increasing with the climate change or the wind conditions? And to kind that, of change that, that's a very good question. There's been one modeling study to look at the future and what will happen in the future. And this is Ray Kazuski and Dunn in GRL. And so you can look at that paper. What they have suggested that the enhancement of the stratification of the central basin of the Pacific Ocean will cause a very striking gradient of chemical parameters and nutrients in the central basin which will then be pushed up onto our continental shelf and will provide conditions of a higher nutrient concentration and much, much lower pH. So the impact of climate change will enhance the acidification by as much as 80% on our shelves. And this may be true for other upwelling areas. So you have to consider what the future climate change signal will have on the coastal upwelling. Very good question, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dick. Uh, we have to move on. The next talk will be given by Torres and Lagos on observing ocean acidification in upwelling regions of South America. Well, I have to make a, a correction. It's, it's just Chile and, and not entire South America. Um, but Chile is a very long country, 4,000 kilometers <laughs> long. Okay. Well, the, what I want to show you is the what I want to show you is the, um, the difference between CO2 between the, the ocean and the atmosphere. And you can see that the, um, this gradient is very different between southern Chile and northern Chile. And this is the upwelling area and it's very close to the North America upwelling system with high levels of uh, outgassing in, in upwelling centers. But also we have fjords uh, in where, where the winds promote downwelling and not upwelling. And here is high stratification. It's very different to, to the upwelling zone. And they behave differently. Two ecosystems uh, behave differently in terms of uh, CO2 outgassing. But as As uh, Richard said, um, both systems can give a very low levels of uh, saturation of aragonite. In, in the case of the upwelling centers, it's related with the uh, respiration, historical respiration uh, in the 100 meter deep layer, for example, and this, this uh, all water which the surface have very low omega. But uh, in southern uh, Patagonia, it's a very rainy place and it's full of estuaries and these very low uh, omega values are, are, are surface water uh, within those estuaries. And similarly to, to, to other subwilling area, it's, it's just because where 
pH drop significantly. And this, in the case of Northern Chile, is related with the advection of very low oxygen water uh, along the coast in the Peru-Chile undercurrent. And this water uh, upwells all along the coastal upwelling area of Chile. And this produced very, this upwelling is, is forced for winds who variabilities about, uh, major vari variabilities about s occurs in between seven and 10 days. And then you can have this uh, uh, drastic change in pH at the scale of 24 hours. And this is, this is, uh, this grid uh, occurred uh, between uh, 24 hour difference. And you can see that in, the, in some period when, when the, the upwelling is active, it could be very low, but uh, a few hours after, after relaxation of the upwelling, the, the, the pH increase. And this is not, it's not very much related with the metabolic activity, but this is related with advection of water. And it's a very fast changes related with the upwelling uh, relaxation dynamic. And, uh, well, we have uh, some information about cruises, but less information of uh, time series. But uh, uh, we just start a time series in, in southern Chile, uh, in an abuelin area. The last, uh, the abuelin occurring, this is uh, the southernmost abuelin area of Chile. And in about two years of, uh, observations, we, we just, uh, we measure alkalinity and pH, but we associate this low, low water, uh, coastal, uh, low temperature water with very low pH and also very high nutrients. And the signal of the boiling is, is, uh, is in all, is in this low, low temperature coastal waters and they are coincident with the, the lowest levels of uh, pH. And uh, the important thing that, that this, is, this is very coastal measurements and uh, where the invertebrates, coastal bentonic invertebrates actually live. And uh, and during upwelling periods, as you can see, the saturation can be very close to the, uh, to the equilibrium level, to the, the saturation level. It's, it's super saturated, but during upwelling events, it's close to be saturated. Um, well, but not, not only the variability, we have a, a strong temporal variability, but also strong spatial va variability. And this is, tip, this is the kind of variability that you found several, there are many examples like that. Uh, a cape and a bay. Normally in this side of the cape, who is exposed to the winds, the, the pH is very low. And a few kilometers inside the bay, the pH is so high. It's because, and also there are a change in in temperature, and you can see here, uh, total carbon increased from north to south, uh, and is related with the exposure to the upwelling winds. And this uh, uh, opened the question about uh, where we will put our time series, is here or there, or maybe in both uh, places to, to have the right signal. And and, and there are different processes acting here than here, even when they are so close in, in distance. Well, uh, the next part of the talk is my colleague, Michael Lagos. Thank you. Briefly, I will try to explain some biological impact in, that we found in, 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 in along the Chilean coast, as showed my colleague Rodrigo. More information there is 
available in the poster session, and we can, we can talk about that. Uh, in, uh, in, in general, we have been using field approach and f uh, laboratory approach to, to make some uh, biological exploration in the same thing that Professor Philly tells us about the, to look for the cannabina colmi that provides some signal of the effect of the ocean acidification uh, already on the, along the Chilean coast. Uh, the first efforts was, were done to build a um, mesoconstrument of facilities to perform some experiments in southern Chile, but that is going uh, function right now uh, in the present days. Using these facilities, for instance, we have been performing some experiment using uh, muscles, the most important uh, economic muscle in the industry in Chile and showing, as you know, negative effects and as in other species, has increased the PCO2 levels. That's really important because it's providing an estimation about the possible impact of the oceanification in the industry of aquaculture in southern Chile. For the highest PCO2 level is projected, for instance, an almost a 30% in decrease of biomass of the uh, aquaculture system, system that which is a uh, significant impact in, in laws for that uh, socioeconomic sector. Uh, another uh, kind of uh, trait that we look for was for behavior uh, uh, in, 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 in some mollusk um, and uh, response in against predation risk, uh, some similar uh, effect about that is the has increased the PCO2 levels, uh, also increased the response to um, predation risks by the, these organisms, uh, suggesting that oceanification can impact a predator-prey relationship and thus having a community or ecosystem consequence. Uh, we are looking also in, in critical stage, larval stage of these organisms, uh, one of the most important uh, in the fishery in Chile, by the Dr. Fritz and Vargas, similar result to other studies, um, reduction in food uh, particle biomass and credence and ingestion rates has increased the PCO2 levels in the experiment. Uh, thus, information in experimental uh, uh, issues uh, was done in parallel with several other um, field studies in, in the same mo species model. For instance, uh, to we look for change in morphology uh, and biomineralization bio along the Chilean coast for these organisms in juvenile stage, and we found that the main differences are in the apex area, in this area, that uh, also is enriched with uh, aragonite than calcite. The calcite is more dominant in the border of the shells, yeah, that it seems to be more, um, uh, Super less change than the apex area because the different susceptibility to dissolution by the both phase of minerals, of carbonate minerals. In addition, uh, we are looking for um, population and community effect along the Chilean coast. In this case, are the frequency distribution of the maximum shell length for the mussels in a given the benthic uh, ecosystem along this area. Uh, the, the distribution shape are different, it suggests in different role, different ecological process operating in different sites. Uh, these sites are very nearby, but uh, we are categorized in terms of marine or estuary influence, uh, taking in, in, in account the, the different influence that can introduce upwelling or uh, the freshwater input that occur along the Chilean coast. Uh, Interestingly, we found, for instance, integrante, integrante only the, the community living inside the mussel bed along the Chilean coast, we found that the um, functional group present different population abundance and associated with the, the categorization in terms of their level of calcification or, or their bodies. For instance, Cirripedia are heavily calcified uh, structures, calcareous structures uh, show a higher uh, abundance in more marine areas um, and increase the abundance of um, fleshy animals in the estuarine area. 
this pattern, uh, Donos is more different than uh, a faunal assemblage described for other centigrade areas, but the difference between functional groups uh, is similar, for instance, to, to change described for the communities influenced by CO2 in Istia, uh, influenced for uh, becoming for the CO2 for vents, uh, vented vents. So uh, in, in the field, we can find this kind of similar uh, this, uh, di difference in terms of fu functional groups. We also have been performing some experiment in the field, uh, basically translocation of individuals from estuarine to marine areas, uh, and look for change in terms of growth, calcification, and interestingly, uh, 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 one of the <coughs> unexpected results was the changes term of the organic layers that produce the muscle organism in this system. Uh, it seems that the organic layer <coughs> is very plastic in terms of the uh, change in the organic composition of this, uh, this layer uh, change fastly as we move the individual from estuarine to marine areas. Uh, uh, this layer, the peristragum, increase or decrease this uh, thickness depending on the uh, habitat where they are experienced uh, this life. Sorry. Uh, the previous studies were related to the benthic habitat. My colleague Christian Vargas is working with other functional groups, zooplankton, phytoplankton, uh, with the same uh, idea, including now the impact, for instance, of the uh, human impact in the watershed along the Chilean coast, and the impact, the additional impact that have on the freshwater input and the changes in carbonate chemistry. Um, sorry. They are new uh, members of the ocean community, Chilean ocean community, uh, that uh, has be become uh, involved with that issues, particularly for postdoctoral students. And we are trying to Re rebuild and, uh, and remain to making oceanification investigation uh, with several proposal on competition based on upwelling ecosystem, oceanic ecosystem, and so like that. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the interest of time, we have to move on. And the next speech will be given by Jeremy on ocean acidification impacts in the Pacific Arctic. I am going to um, follow up those really nice talks so far with a discussion of what's going on in the Pacific Arctic region. Um, we've made a number of uh, measurements over the past few years uh, that we've shown here on the map. All the red dots are the, the, the stations where we've made at least one occupation. In a lot of places, we've made multiple occupations, either over uh, several seasons or over the course of a time series. And the three regions that I'm going to focus on that we roughly define as this Pacific Arctic region is the Gulf of Alaska, where there's really no sea ice cover, there's high terrestrial and glacial input and moderate levels of productivity. And then region number two, which is the Bering Sea, where there is seasonal sea ice cover, uh, very high rates of productivity, particularly over the central part of the Bering Sea shelf, and then large inputs from two uh, river systems uh, that drain most of uh, western Alaska. And then finally, the western Arctic Ocean, uh, where there's also seasonal sea ice coverage, but there are two very distinctly different shelf seas. There's a Chukchi Sea uh, over here that is highly productive in the summertime, and then the Beaufort Sea over here on the eastern side, uh, which has very low rates of productivity. And so, as we've seen in these talks, and, and even in the modeling talk, the very first one that Jerry gave, that localized regional drivers are far more likely or far more important uh, in these coastal seas than changes in anthropogenic CO2 uh, for a number of different reasons that I'm going to show you. 
So to start off with, why is the um, Pacific Arctic region more vulnerable to ocean acidification? And if we look at Dick's paper that he published in 2004, and you can really see immediately that the, the Western Pacific, or the, the Eastern Pacific, and particularly the, North, uh, the Northern Pacific, uh, the saturation horizon is very near to the surface. And so these waters are already preconditioned to have low saturation states. And then particularly in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea, the biological pump is very effective at moving carbon dioxide um, from the atmosphere through photosynthesis down uh, into the water column. And then ultimately we see those very large respiration signals uh, that Dick showed uh, in his talk and that we've seen in some of the other ones. And then finally, um, to an even more or greater influence in some places, the sea ice melt and glacial influence also drives uh, a reduction in total alkalinity and a reduction in saturation state. And so we're going to have a debate going on, and, and we don't quite know the answer yet, of, you know, this is an anthropogenically induced climate change. This is something that's, that's causing or being caused by human activities, but it's not necessarily CO2-driven ocean acidification, but it is a, an exacerbation uh, of that reduction in omega. And then finally, this region um, is probably more than anywhere else, and, and Dick and I debate this, and Joe Salisbury and I had a conversation this morning uh, about where commercial interests uh, are really co-located with rapidly changing saturation states and pH. And so we've got some recent examples uh, of species that have shown uh, varying levels of impacts to ocean acidification. The bad news is uh, for the king crab, which is a major species in the Bering Sea and to a certain extent in the Gulf of Alaska, two recent studies that were done uh, in the Kodiak Fisheries Lab by uh, Bob Foy's group showed that the acidified embryos, uh, it took 33% longer for them to hatch, uh, and they had lower survival rates. They showed increased calcium carbonate concentration uh, er, in their shells. Uh, and although the, the results are really not clear, there was a detrimental effect uh, to the king crabs uh, in this study uh, with really unknown consequences of how that's going to now cascade out uh, into the ecosystem as the, particularly the Bering Sea experienced these changes. The better news was a Pollock study that uh, a colleague of mine, Tom Hurst, we just finished a, a two-year study uh, looking at uh, juvenile uh, and larval Pollock, and the Pollock themselves seemed to do okay uh, in a higher CO2 uh, environment. The fish didn't show uh, any significant signs of metabolic stress when they were exposed to high CO2, uh, but however, their prey stocks uh, may ultimately be vulnerable, and that's something that the, the study didn't cover uh, is how uh, their food sources will be affected. And also, uh, Tom has just started a new study where he's actually looking at the behavior uh, of the juvenile pollock, and it looks like they do exhibit uh, some changes in behavior uh, when they're exposed to high CO2 conditions. So uh, while it's sort of initial uh, good news for the pollock, I, I think we still have a number of um, studies to do before we can conclusively say anything about it. <clears throat> we have started to synthesize um, some uh, of the more sensitive benthic species uh, in the region to look at and try to understand how they're going to respond. And as I said, the Bering Sea, uh, particularly with the tanner crab and the snow crab, you can see they're very extensive habitat uh, over this region. And I'm going to show you in a few slides why we're really worried about this region uh, in uh, the sort of the central part of the Bering Sea. As we start looking at some data that we've collected uh, over the last couple of years, the thing I want to focus on first is this story about the glacial runoff, particularly from the Tidewater Glaciers. We've got two studies going on down in Glacier Bay, Alaska, which is down near Juneau, uh, and then up uh, closer uh, into the northern Gulf of Alaska uh, in a place called Prince William Sound. And what we found in both places is that this Tidewater glacial runoff um, is very low in total alkalinity. And so this is work by one of my graduate students, Stacy Reisdorf, uh, that she's getting ready to publish where she's quantified the percentage of the fresh water uh, that's located in these estuaries and then related that to the total alkalinity. So you can see as, as the percentage of fresh water increases, total alkalinity goes down significantly compared to what the marine member is up uh, closer to 2100. Uh, the glacial meltwater is down closer to 1400. And you can see that that, that glacial meltwater is very low in uh, aragonite saturation state. And so she made seasonal observations in Glacier Bay. This is summer, fall, winter, spring, and summer. And you can see um, that there's a number of things going on. There's a biological effect uh, 
that's really having an influence on saturation states, but then there's also these times during summer where the bay is completely inundated uh, with this low total alkalinity glacial meltwater, uh, and it's causing, in some cases, the entire bay, the surface waters of the bay, uh, to be undersaturated in aragonite. We see the same feature uh, in Prince William Sound, uh, another large, heavily uh, influenced area uh, by these tidewater glaciers. We've seen very low surface aragonite undersaturations up uh, in, at the face of the glacier. Then we also see that same water out in the Gulf of Alaska. So it's getting exported out over the shelf. Uh, and in the surface waters, we have seen uh, undersaturations. And we're starting to think about um, you know, how this flux of, of fresh water is really going to change surface saturation states. And we also, when we think about Greenland, you know, expanding this out of all that glacial meltwater that's coming off of Greenland uh, into the North Atlantic, uh, I, I think there's a really interesting story uh, to be told there. And again, it's, it's not CO2 ocean acidification. Uh, it is another anthropogenically induced reduction uh, in saturation states and a lowering of total alkalinity. If we move out into sort of the oceanic environment, we've done a time series line out here in the northern Gulf of Alaska uh, for the past five years. I've got four years of data here uh, to show you, and this system works a lot like Dick was showing uh, for the west coast, where we make observations twice a year in May and in September, and this is 2008, 2009, 10, and 11, and saturation state, undersaturated water is the, the blues and the purples. And you can see there's a, there's a big change between spring and fall as this corrosive water that's undersaturated in aragonite gets pushed up onto the shelf, uh, and in some cases the saturation horizon uh, comes up to about 100 meters. So there's really two things that are affecting the shelf. You see the bottom waters are being exposed to the undersaturated waters uh, for at least a couple of months out of the year. But then we also have these surface features, the glacial meltwater, uh, that's impacting uh, the surface. And so if you think about pteropods, uh, and we've shown you know, recently that there, are, there is some pteropod dissolution actually occurring uh, now, that the pteropods don't have a lot of space to, to really migrate up and down in the water column. If, they're, you know, if the surface is undersaturated because of the glacial meltwater and the saturation horizon is shoaling because of the upwelling, the range of, of water that's, um, that's not going to be corrosive to those pteropod shells is going to get smaller and smaller, particularly as the anthropogenic CO2 loading increases. The Bering Sea, which is, I think, the most dynamic area we're looking at right now uh, from an ocean acidification standpoint, but also because of that biological impact and commercial impact standpoint, we see a, a, another similar feature. Dick mentioned the strong respiration signal, and we see that in the Bering Sea. This is observations that we made in summer and fall, and this is aragonite uh, on the top and calcite uh, on the bottom. And so you see the biological productivity really consumes DIC in the surface waters uh, during this time as saturation states go up, but all that, ex that organic matter gets exported to the bottom where it's respired, and so it, during this time of year, saturation states are very low. So it's undersaturated in aragonite over the entire shelf uh, during these occupations, and we even observed some calcite undersaturations uh, at around 80 meters um, in this year. This was 2009. And so we really ask ourselves the question, um, just because we had made it with the observations from the crews, how long those undersaturations persisted. And we put a mooring in uh, that was capable of measuring. We put, put CO2 and pH in, on the bottom of this mooring. Uh, and unfortunately, the pH sensor failed. Uh, but we ended up with CO2 and oxygen. And so we used that data, along with some of our crews' data, to develop this correlation between PCO2 and aragonite. And we found that when PCO2 is around 700. We think the aragonite is, is undersaturated or near undersaturated. And so what I've drawn here is, is a line for you is where uh, PCO2 reaches 700. And you can see we were well in excess of that. It went up to over 1,500 and stayed there until October. Unfortunately, we had to pull the mooring out in October of this year. And so we see that there were three or four months uh, where the bottom waters of the Bering Sea were, were undersaturated or aragonite. And, and at this CO2 level, it was probably close to uh, undersaturation for calcite as well. So this is something that it's the bent that calcifiers in the Bering Sea are dealing with uh, right now today. So just some more work that has shown the, the sort of dynamic variability of the Bering Sea. This is a work that Jessica Cross, another one of my graduate students that's just finishing up, has just published. Uh, she did a very comprehensive alkalinity budget uh, over the shelf, and she found two really interesting features. For one, she found this alkalinity deficit uh, over the central part of the shelf, 
and that corresponded to a coccolithophore bloom. So the coccoliths were drawing down uh, the alkalinity out of the water column. But then probably I think the more interesting feature that she found was this alkalinity, this excess alkalinity down near the bottom. And what we think that is is carbonate mineral dissolution that was occurring uh, because of the undersaturated conditions that were persisting long enough uh, over the summer and fall months to actually dissolve uh, the calcium carbonate uh, and, and have that excess signal. If we move up into the Chukchi Sea, uh, it functions very much the same way as the Bering Sea does, where summer high rates of summer primary productivity draw down PCO2 and increase saturation state, where we have the same feature at the bottom where aragonite becomes undersaturated uh, in August and September. But again, we don't know how long these undersaturations persist. Um, we haven't been able to get a mooring up there yet to, to quantify this, but we do know that it's functioning very similarly. And we look at it spatially. Uh, this is bottom water uh, saturation states. And so you can see over this sort of northeastern section of the Chukchi Sea, the bottom waters were widely undersaturated. This was in September uh, of 2012. Uh, where we found these undersaturations. The surface water uh, has higher saturation states. We're not, we didn't see undersaturations at the surface, but they were still pretty low uh, during this time of year. And this sort of leads us into the question of what's controlling uh, these saturation states. Obviously, primary productivity is having a big impact on it, uh, but then there's also this sea ice melt. And so this is going back uh, to Michi Yamamoto Kawai's paper in 2009, where she had about a dozen measurements where she showed uh, some surface water undersaturations uh, that were due to sea ice. We've been able to do cruises for the past three years where we've made uh, about 2,000 uh, discrete measurements uh, from Dutch Harbor all the way up into the Arctic and then back out again, where we're really seeing a lot of these unique features. Over here uh, on the eastern side, we see very low saturation states where the, where the sea ice is accumulating. And then there are some other features. Claudine Hari is working on a paper right now explaining why we see this, these low saturation states over here in, in these areas. So understanding this dynamic variability is going to be really important as we go forward. And then finally, the last major feature um, is over here in the Beaufort Sea, where I said the productivity is low. But this area also experiences very intense upwelling uh, during the fall months. And so this was an, an upwelling event that we captured uh, during one of our cruises where we actually saw uh, water that was undersaturated in aragonite uh, being upwelled onto the shelf. And so with all this dynamic variability, we're trying to get a handle uh, of ultimately what the controls are and, and how it's changing through the season. And so we've begun to deploy our Alaska ocean acidification buoy network. And so I've just plotted here for you the first sort of five or six months of data from our first three sites, which are southeast Alaska and then these two on the northern uh, Gulf of Alaska Shelf, and just by looking at these three slides, you can really see uh, the difference in, in just how these systems are functioning. And so this will be interesting to continue to build this record. We've also got pH um, at the surface, and then we've got PCO2 and pH near the bottom. So I think we'll gain a lot of insights from these measurements. And we're feeding that all in. Um, I think one of the most exciting things we're doing right now is developing this ocean acidification vulnerability index where we've looked at the economic data, we've used some model results to project forward the changes in saturation states in all of these regions, and we've come up with a fairly quantitative assessment uh, of how the economy in the state of Alaska is going to respond uh, to ocean acidification over the next uh, 100 years. And the real take-home message of this story is this social resiliency index up here at the top. The greens mean the regions have a high social resiliency index. If you took the fisheries out of these economies, um, they could probably do okay. The browns and the, the sort of dark reds are areas that have a very low social resiliency index, 10 to 20 percent, which means the loss of fisheries would probably mean a, a loss of, of these regions. And there are upwards of 55,000 subsistence residents that live uh, in this part of Alaska. Uh, that rely on these fisheries. And, you know, we saw Dick's $110 million uh, oyster industry, and Joe said, it, you know, he's got a $200 million oyster industry in, in Maine. This is a $1.5 billion fishery uh, in the Bering Sea um, that's 50 percent of, of all the U.S. fish catch. So it could have a major impact on the economy uh, if there starts to be a major loss of these fisheries. So just to sum up, uh, all three regions, uh, the Gulf of Alaska, the Bering Sea, and the Arctic, are experiencing at least seasonal uh, undersaturations in aragonite, and those are being uh, exacerbated and enhanced 
by the intrusion of anthropogenic CO2, but also by some of these regional factors like the glacial meltwater. The impacts of the ecosystems are still obviously largely unknown. Uh, the laboratory studies obviously have their weaknesses, uh, so capturing uh, this in real time, or at least in the real environment, uh, is something we should really focus on. Um, and understanding how the, how the food web is going to react. You know, I said that the, the pollock don't show uh, a direct causal relationship to ocean acidification, uh, but loss of prey source or uh, change in habitat may ultimately affect them. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, in the interest of time, we have to move on. Uh, the final speaker, Pedro, could not be with us, but uh, Brant will tell us the story in the, in the Southern Ocean. Um, Pedro Montero was supposed to give this talk and he regrets that he wasn't able to get here and uh, sent me a few slides today and I've added a few more. So um, I just wanted to start off by um, talking about the motivation for the work. This is a model output of, uh, uh, from uh, Richard Lapeer and Ben McNeil uh, that predicts uh, aragonite undersaturation uh, in less than 20 years in the Southern Ocean during winter conditions. And uh, there's a, oh, and, and there's already evidence of some effects of uh, acidification uh, on uh, the weights of uh, foram shells and uh, also on the pteropods. So uh, it's, there's quite a bit of interest in how, the, how acidification is evolving in the Southern Ocean. Uh, these are the typical um, issues we're trying to address to detect the change, determine what's driving the change, so how it's varying regionally, how it, um, are there other influences just apart from CO2 uptake, and you've heard a bunch of uh, other examples of what could cause acidification change. And then determine the ecosystem response and develop improved predictions. It, it's actually, this is quite disjointed, I think, at the moment, for the Southern Ocean from the first two. Um, you know, as people are doing incubations and they're looking at uh, responses of organisms and then how we relate that to what we see in the uh, ocean is uh, very, it's a, it's a very difficult problem and it's something I guess will, uh, that will evolve over um, in the future. I think it's um, fair to say that we don't have the uh, coverage that the other groups have um, had when we're talking about the uh, North Pacific. It's, um, but at the same time, I think that the community has done a pretty good job of looking at the large-scale carbon system parameters and getting ideas uh, or pretty good representations of the, uh, those variables that we need to calculate um, pH uh, or detect pH and change in acidification. And for example, anthropogenic CO2 storage estimates uh, surface ocean CO2 uh, estimates from uh, Takahashi. And most of this has been done with uh, ships and, and uh, underway sampling. Uh, I want to point out that Dick and uh, Jerry and a lot of other people were talking, uh, the, the previous speakers were talking about a lot of issues of, uh, that don't apply in the Southern Ocean, except in maybe some small embayments. So, uh, there's no riverine input to be worried about. Um, there's meltwater from sea ice, but it's actually quite small. Uh, it, it only changes salinity by small amounts generally. So it doesn't have a huge effect on saturation state. It does have a small effect. And in most places, there's not a lot of evidence for anaerobic diagenesis in the sediments. And there's very little evidence for strong calcification in the sediments also, or in the water column. So they're very different systems. This is um, a reasonable summary of the observing network and I wanted to, it's, it's based on uh, at the top the repeat hydrographic sections that have been carried out for the last uh, 20 or so years. Uh, the underway observing network uh, to measure surface CO2 parameters and uh, in the last couple of years there's been a, a few time series sites established. So uh, the ones with the triangles are uh, 
moored instruments. Uh, we just saw uh, an example of uh, instruments off, moored off uh, Alaska that measure PCO2 and, uh, every few hours, and, and they're the same kind of instruments. Uh, there's one in the Southern Ocean now, which is a uh, CSIRO-NOAA uh, collaboration. Uh, and the, the dots are discrete sampling locations that have been, uh, that are either recently active or are still active. Uh, so monthly sampling for carbonate system parameters and other variables. There's one in Davis uh, off Cridge Bay and two on the Antarctic Peninsula, including Rothera. Uh, I, I want to give a plug to the hydrographic sections. They're very important in the Southern Ocean. This is a, a, a picture of a um, cold water coral reef in uh, the South Tasman Sea. It's at about 20, 1,200 metres depth. It's at right at the, the uh, aragonite, where uh, aragonite becomes undersaturated. And they're fairly extensive reef systems that occur on a lot of the seamounts in this region in the Southern Antarctic zone. Uh, the, the only way we have to detect change in the, the deeper ocean is through the sections at the moment in this region. And so it's very important for us to understand uh, what these reefs, deep water corals are being exposed to. Uh, I'll, I'll just add one thing. We have done some fairly extensive sampling around these uh, reefs and it, it's very interesting that you can actually find healthy growing corals 2,000 metres below the saturation horizon for aragonite. So um, there are many multiple influences on, on these, uh, the growth of these corals. They're just not as extensive down deeper. The, um, I, I think it's fair to say that this, uh, there are large gaps in our observing system of the Southern Ocean, and Jan mentioned this in her talk. And these are the these red lines are surface uh, observations that have been made uh, and reported in SOCAT, and you can see huge changes, uh, huge gaps. Uh, they're uh, seasonally biased, so most of this data comes from the summer months when ships can get into the Southern Ocean, and there's uh, a large un undersampling on the shells. So, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I think we just have to recognise there's big gaps and, and they're going to be hard to fill. Um, I want to talk a little bit about coastal um, uh, carbonate chemistry. And this is a picture of the uh, Mertz Polynia, which is, uh, was a, um, a very uh, uh, strong region for sea ice formation and bottom water formation uh, in about 140 degrees east in belly land. The, this is the Mertz Glacier Tongue, and the Polynia is in here. It's quite an extensive Polynia. The Glacier Tongue was about 100 kilometres wide. And I just want to talk to you about some of the variability that occurs in the in the region. In 2008, there was a very extensive survey of, the sat of carbonate chemistry from the Glacier Tongue here. Uh, the Polynia is in this region. And these are the bottom water valleys of saturation state. So in the very deep trough uh, of the uh, shelf, which is uh, over 600 metres deep, some of these troughs, uh, saturation states are about one or, or slightly below. And in shallower waters, they're, they're higher, they're above one. Um, what was interesting during 2008, there was uh, a, a lot of camera work done on the bottom and some fairly extensive reefs were located in the drainage channels for the Polynia. And, um, but just as a contrast, just below that, 1,100 metres of uh, below the saturation horizon, there was virtually nothing on the floor. So this, this reef here is uh, uh, deep sea corals and sponges and it's pretty extensive and there's quite a bit of this uh, trying to cover along the, the uh, shelf edge. So, oh, there we go. These are some of the, the water column profiles that show aragonite saturation state. Uh, the red ones uh, were collected near the reef, near the reefs, there was a series of them. Uh, black was where there was some sparse coral cover on the bottom, and green was where there was none. The implication is, perhaps that the saturation states are elevated around the dense, uh, dense coral uh, cover regions. And it's where the, the um, water is draining from the polynia. So they might be, it looks 
it looks like the surface, uh, there's biological reduction in the surface that's modifying the uh, carbonate chemistry, increasing saturation states. That gets mixed into the bottom. And this grey zone here is where the uh, reefs are located, the depth range. And it may be, uh, it's circumstantial evidence that there's surface production is actually improving conditions for growth of these reefs. There are other effects too, like the um, um, advection of particulate matter out of the polymers that supply food to these corals. It could also affect their distribution. Um, there was a very interesting thing that happened in 2008. So that was the data uh, I showed you just now. It was from 2008. It was uh, a paper that uh, Elizabeth Shaw just submitted. And oh, sorry, I'll get this. This is the Mertz Glacier Tongue here. And the polynia is on this side of the glacier tongue. And this is another uh, um, iceberg. It was called B9B that came from the Ross Sea. And in, in early 2010, it started moving and it hit the Mertz Glacier Tongue and uh, broke it off. So it was about a 70 kilometre by 30 kilometre chunk of ice that went out into the uh, Southern Ocean. And B9B became grounded. Uh, in 2011, so a year after that, uh, that event, the region was resampled, and you can see in the blue lines there was a uh, there is a drawdown of uh, carbon in the Polynya region. In the red line is the 2011 sampling, and the, and you can see there's even stronger drawdown. What happened is that when the glacier tongue was broken off, there was a lot of ice behind the B9B that was uh, released, and it started to melt and it caused a very stable surface layer and it, it, it uh, triggered a bloom of diatoms that, um, and because of increased light and uh, maybe iron supply from the ice. The, the net effect was some strong CO2 drawdown and increase in the saturation state of the water. In 2011, the place, it was resampled again in this location and, and the drawdown was even larger and it looks like the bloom had persisted for a long time and um, it was interesting that it actually increased the saturation state again. So this is one, ex I, I put this up here because it's one example of um, changes in the natural system affecting the saturation states in a way that we don't necessarily expect. The, uh, the, the, situ uh, the situation in the Southern Ocean, of course, is there's gonna be increased melting and so it's potential that we'll get increased stratification of the waters along uh, the coastline, and we may actually see not an increase in, a decrease in saturation state due to acidification, but an increase. It's not clear that this will occur all along the coast, though, but it's just one example of um, how natural processes can really change uh, what we're predicting from models. Uh, this is another uh, a case of variability in, in the region, though, and I just wanted to uh, show this. It was uh, in, in 1993, Four or five. There was sampling done uh, off uh, the Prince Bay, in uh, shown in blue, and pH was measured and DIP. The dashed line here shows what uh, change would be expected in pH and DIC, just due to uh, uptake from CO2 from the atmosphere. And you can see that the changes are actually about twice as great in the water column. So it's the opposite effect of uh, the work, uh, the Prince Bay result, but. It just shows some of the complexity that occurs along the uh, Antarctic coast. And it's going to be very difficult to interpret uh, how ecosystems might respond there. There's so much variability. Um, I, I don't... Um, this, this is just to show, well, we really do need to fill gaps in, in the data set. And we have very poor coverage at present. The... Um, there, there's very little infrastructure down there that we can utilise, so research ships are an excellent platform. It's the only way we can get underway observations. And I think we need to uh, really start to look at not just measure PCO2 on them, but we have to introduce other uh, parameters. And there are some ships that already do this, this set of parameters uh, in the Southern Ocean, but we need to really expand that and try and get some decent coverage. They will still be restricted to work in the... Um, uh, summer months, there will be very w little winter data. But there's other uh, new technologies that are being developed. Uh, we saw some examples of them, wave gliders, profiling floats and uh, 
uh, smoke and gliders that can be utilised with new sensors uh, to get to improve the data coverage. The other thing uh, we probably need to really consider is that Cathy showed a picture of all the sites around the world that are being monitored for ocean acidification. And there's a lot of bases along the coast uh, that we, uh, we could be easily instrumented uh, with things like pH sensors, temperature, salinity, oxygen, and uh, be sampled each month for water column, uh, water chemistry. And there's a, uh, a lot of interest. There's some already established on the peninsula and here in Prids Bay, and we've uh, begun talking with other groups to try and do this at other bases around the, the continent, around the uh, Antarctic. Um, I guess we, there, there are a lot of discussion points. Jan, Jan mentioned quite a few, and uh, we really need to know, in the Southern Ocean, there's such a small community doing measurements, and it's very difficult to resource and have enough people uh, and the platforms are limited. So we really need to establish at this meeting uh, and hopefully well, very soon the essential variables that the community needs to measure. And uh, the other thing we probably should consider is how to, uh, if, if long-term ecological research stations and, uh, uh, or sites are needed uh, into the future, which combines physics, biogeochemistry and ecosystems. We're not going to be able to cover the whole coast. We probably need to work out how to uh, do uh, parts of the coast well. And uh, we also need probably to address the issue of multi-platform approaches, how to use ships, gliders and moorings effectively. And I think, I hope that these are the kind of things that will come out of this uh, network meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian.